our number 10 spot we have the Salem UFO. On the morning of July 16, 1952, this photo was captured by Shell Alpert and has stumped people ever since. The photo shows four unidentified objects hovering in the air above Salem, Massachusetts and was taken at the Salem Coast Guard Air Station. The objects seem to be above the Winter Island and Cat Cove areas, but there really isn't much more that is known about this strange incident. There are a few theories regarding this photo. One is a camera glitch, others think it may just be light reflecting off of the window that the photo was taken through, but of course there are people who point to similar incidents that happened in the 1950s and of course believe it is proof of extraterrestrial beings. It is very likely we may never know exactly what's going on here, but the air of mystery it leaves is definitely kind of cool. In our number 9 spot today we have the frozen man of Mount Everest. This photo comes from 1996 and it shows Beck Weathers getting treated after the Mount Everest disaster. The Mount Everest disaster took place on May 10th and 11th in 1996 where there was a blizzard on the mountain that ended up stranding and taking the lives of 8 people who were aiming to descend the mountain. Beck was a part of the team who was climbing the mountain on this fateful day and he ended up suffering from snow blindness during the climb. He actually fell into a hypothermic coma because it was so cold and he suffered severe frostbite on his face, hands and feet. Pretty miraculously he not only survived but ended up walking back down to camp in order to get help where he was then taken by helicopter to receive treatment. He ended up needing his hands, parts of his feet and even his nose amputated but he survived this whole ordeal and that is the most important thing. In our number 8 spot today we have the reflecting pool. This is one of the creepiest or most chilling images ever taken. It depicts a young girl in a graveyard who is looking down at a reflection in a pond. Ok, maybe a little eerie but not exactly chilling. What makes this photo what it is however is that there are seemingly two reflections looking back up at this little girl. No one knows who this girl is, where she is or even when this photo was taken but it is estimated to have come from somewhere around the early 1900s. This photo was analyzed and it has been said that it is unaltered or edited. Who knows how this photo was possible? Maybe there was some sort of invisible entity standing beside her that we could only see the reflection of? Like a reverse vampire or something. In our number 7 spot today we have the elephant's foot. This photo looks like it's just a big lump of nothing but it is called an elephant's foot. No, it's of course not a real elephant's foot and instead is just called that because of its appearance. This lump was actually created from the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown and it is just a mass of corium and other materials that were in the core of the reactor. This elephant's foot was located in the steam distribution corridor which is under what's left of the reactor. While this mass doesn't produce as much radiation as it did before, it does still produce a deadly amount even today. Like so much so that just a few minutes of being around it is enough to get a lethal dose of radiation. It's kind of crazy that even though they knew this, they were still standing there taking pictures of it. For a long time the severity of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster was being kept a secret from the public and those who it mattered to the most. Photos like these only give us a glimpse into this horrible disaster and how things went down. In our number 6 spot today we have the penitentiary. This photo comes from what is left of the Eastern State Penitentiary in Pennsylvania. This prison used to be the most famous and the most expensive in the world, but now this is the sort of thing that is left of it. This prison is actually now used as a tourist attraction and it becomes a haunted house during Halloween. The prison used to house some pretty high profile prisoners such as Scarface himself, Al Capone. The prison was opened in 1829 and was known for its advanced technology for the time. They had things like central heating, flush toilets and shower baths in each cell. These were all considered luxuries in 1829. The first prisoner to be held there was Charles Williams who was facing a two year sentence for theft. When he arrived at the prison he had a hood over his head so as to protect his identity but also so that he wouldn't know what the rest of the prison looked like so he would never be able to plan an escape. While prison is never good, the craziest thing about this specific one is that all of the prisoners lived in isolation. I can't even imagine what that would be like, especially for the people who found themselves there for a long period of time. This photo is just a truly haunting reminder of all that once went on in this prison. In our number 5 spot today we have the Stanford Prison Experiment. This photo comes from 1971 during the Stanford Prison Experiment. For those of you who aren't familiar with this experiment, it started on August 14th, 1971 and was led by university psychology professor Philip Zimbardo. The experiment took student volunteers and divided them into two groups, one group of prisoners and one group of guards and they placed all of the volunteers into a fake prison that was created for this experiment. Experiment. The experiment aimed to see if and how quickly humans would turn evil under the right conditions 
with the right amount of power. Basically it was a test to try and answer the question of if humans are inherently good or inherently evil. I think everyone was pretty shocked with the results. After just 6 days the experiment needed to be concluded because the guards began absolutely tormenting the prisoners. It really showed the kinds of things humans can be capable of even after a short time. This photo is definitely reminiscent of that experiment and it serves as our reminder. In our number 4 spot today we have the acid drum. This photo comes to us from the inside of a house of one of the most terrible people, the serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. This photo was taken from the inside of his home after he was found and caught by authorities. Before his arrest, he was sadly able to take the lives of 17 people. Although this photo might look kind of plain, the horrors are plentiful. This shot shows a full drum of acid that was located inside of his home. I probably don't need to tell you what it was used for because who has a full drum of acid inside of their home? Especially when you're a serial killer. I can't imagine the horrors investigators saw when they entered his home, and even previous to that as they investigated his crimes. Thankfully, Jeffrey was caught, and in 1992, he was sentenced to life in prison, but just two years later, he was killed by a fellow prison inmate. In our number 3 spot today, we have the gadget. This photo shows the first ever atomic bomb, and it comes to us from 1945. Called the gadget, this bomb was an implosion plutonium device that was detonated in the Trinity test in 1945. This photo shows someone sitting next to it, so casually, like it's a stuffed animal and not like it's a world changing device. The Trinity test was the very first time a nuclear weapon was detonated, and the gadget was actually of the same design as the bomb that was later detonated over Nagasaki, Japan on August 9th, 1945. There is a very eerie nature about this photo and the seemingly casual behavior of the man next to it. Did he know what this was about to unleash? Perhaps not, but more eerily, Maybe he did. In our number 2 spot today we have change. This photo was taken by Fred Blackwell on May 28, 1963 and is actually showing us a moment of protest. The three sitting at the counter are Joan Trompour, Anne Moody and their sociology teacher John Salter. The reason why this photo is so important is because these three are sitting at a quote white only counter at Woolworth's 5 and Dime store in Jackson, Mississippi while being attacked by an angry mob. People are throwing condiments at them and I'm sure saying some pretty nasty things. Things. The two students went to Tougaloo College, which was a black college that ended up being at the core of the civil rights movement in Mississippi. It's amazing to see how brave they are and a photo like this is really such an important message for us to remember today. In our number 1 spot today we have Bikini Island. Bikini in the Marshall Islands was once inhabited by around 170 islanders until 1945 rolled around. The US president at the time, Harry Truman, ordered that the military continue to test nuclear weapons just in case they were needed in the future since this was shortly after the end of World War II. Unfortunately, Bikini was the place that was chosen to be the testing site since all planes and ships traveled on routes that weren't close to the area. The residents of the island were asked to vacate, quote, for the good of mankind and to end all world wars, to which they of course obliged under the impression that they would one day be able to move back. Test weapons were detonated on the reef itself, on the sea, in the air, and underwater, and this photo shows what was happening during just one of these tests and it wasn't even the largest one. Although the former residents of Bikini were promised that they would one day be able to return home, the island still remains uninhabited because of the mass amounts of radiation that still exist here. Number 10, Sea Creature. Hook Island is off the coast of Queensland, Australia, and Robert Le Serac, his family, and a friend, Hank De Jong, stayed there for three months in late 1964. On December 12, 1964, the Le Seracs and Hank were crossing Stowhaven Bay on an island when Robert's wife noticed something odd in the water. It was a long, tadpole-like creature. It was black and it was believed that it was at least 30 feet long. Robert and Hank decided to venture into the water and record it on film. When they entered the water, the monster was even bigger than they thought. But as they started recording, the creature opened its mouth and swam away. When they checked the film, they had no footage of the creature, but the pictures clearly showed it. The pictures were published in a magazine and eventually spread across the world, making it one of the most famous and unexplained pictures of a cryptid. Number 9. 
a spaceman? This is one of the world's most famous mysterious photos. The image was taken by Jim Templin near Solway Firth in Kurmba, England in 1964. It is a simple photo of his daughter, but behind Jim's daughter, who was supposed to be the only figure in the picture, there is another entity resembling a spaceman. Jim insists he did not see anyone else present when the photograph was taken, so what's behind her? The image was reproduced widely in contemporary newspapers and gained the interest of UFOologists. Jim took the picture to the police in Carlsey, who, after many doubts, examined it and stated there was nothing suspicious about it. The local newspaper, the Cumberland News, picked up the story and within hours it was all over the world. Regarding the photo, Jim said, The picture is certainly not fake and I am bemused as anyone else as to how this figure appeared in the background. Over the four decades the photo has been in the public domain, I have had many thousands of letters from all around the world with various ideas or possibilities, which most make little sense to me. Modern analysis suggests that the figure might have been the photographer's wife standing with her back towards the cameras, but not even this explanation is convincing enough. Number 8. Strange Lights Since the 1940s, and possibly even earlier, there has been a strange light phenomenon observed in Hesdalen Valley, Norway. The spectacle has a form of white or yellow light of unknown origin standing or floating above ground level. Between 1981 and 1984, the lights were observed observed up to 20 times per week, but have drastically reduced in frequency since then about 10 to 20 times per year. Why the decrease all of a sudden? No one knows. No one knows where the lights come from, but UFO enthusiasts took this as a sign that the valley was a portal to other worlds. It wasn't just conspiracy theorists that were interested in this, as the strange bursts of light in the 1980s attracted physicists too. Interest peaked by the idea of some sort of explained natural natural phenomenon. In the decades since, scientists have determined the glow likely comes from air turned into plasma. Despite ongoing research and numerous working hypotheses, there is no convincing explanation for the origin of these lights and seems like it will always be a mystery. Number 7. Fairy Circles For those of you with trypophobia, look away. Found in the arid grasslands of the western part of South Africa, the fairy circles are circular patches of barren land. They typically occur in monospecific grassy vegetation, and the circles vary between 7 and 49 feet in diameter. Until 2014, the phenomenon was only known to occur in the western parts of southern Africa, but that year, ecologists were alerted to similar rings of vegetation outside of Africa and a part of Pilbara in western Australia. There are various myths about these fairy circles. One from Himba people say that these barren patches are said to have been caused by the gods, spirits, and natural divinities. Of specific beliefs, the Himba people note that their original ancestor, Merkuru, was responsible for the creation of the fairy circles or that they were the footprints of gods. Another myth promoted by some tour guides is that the circles are formed by a dragon in the earth and that its poisonous breath kills the vegetation. The origin and history of fairy circles have long been a puzzle and even now, scientists are not sure who or what created them. One favorite assumption is that a sand termite is responsible for the circles, but the range of the phenomenon is much wider than that of termite species, so it's unknown. Number 6. Ghostly Waters In December 1924, James Courtney and Michael Meehan were crew members of the SS Watertown. While on the ship, they were cleaning a car cargo tank of the oil tanker and they were overcome by gas fumes which resulted in both of their deaths. Due to this, the crew buried them in the sea but to their astonishment, the ghostly faces of the soldiers appeared in the water the next day. Yeah, like in the waves. Later on, many crew members reported to see the faces as well. The faces were so visible that the captain of the ship ordered them to take a picture of them to have proof. You know, so people didn't think that they were all crazy. In the picture, you can clearly see two faces and it's just plain creepy. When they returned to the land, the negative was even checked for fakery and proclaimed genuine. Number 5. Pyramid on the Moon this is for all the people who believe that the moon is real. In December 1972, this image was taken by Apollo 17 in the area known as Geophone Rock. NASA listed the image as blank, but after retouching the photo, you can see that it's not completely blank. Turning up the contrast, a pyramidal structure can be seen. So 
What was it? Was it some malfunction of the camera or is there actually a pyramid on the moon? NASA has never given a credible version of the issue which has led some speculations about what else can actually be on the moon hidden to public awareness. And listen, not to be a crazy conspiracy theorist, but maybe it's true that aliens built the pyramids on earth as it looks like they did on the moon too. NASA, please tell us the truth. Number 4. Figure climbing the stairs. Reverend Ralph Hardy, a retired clergyman from White Rock, British Columbia, took this famous photograph in 1966. Originally, he only wanted to take a picture of the elegant tulip staircase in the Queen's House section of the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, England. And I mean, I don't blame him, they're pretty. But upon development, the photo revealed a shrouded figure climbing the stairs. It's strange and unsettling, and Ralph says there was no one else in the frame when he took it. So is it a ghost? That seems like the most reasonable explanation at this point. Experts who examined the original negative concluded that it had not been tampered with. The vicinity of the staircase is rumored to be haunted and unexplained footsteps had often be heard there. So it could definitely be a ghost, but it's still very strange. Number three, the young boy. One of the most famous haunted houses in the United States is the Dutch Colonel House at 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville, New York. The haunting stems from the night of November 13, 1974, when 23 year old Ronald Defoe killed all six members of his family. He was then arrested, convicted, and given six concurrent life sentences. In December of 1975, George and Kathy Lutz, along with their three children, moved into the house and claimed that spooky things were happening. For example, George would wake up at 3 15 every morning, which was the approximate time that Ronald killed his family. Kathleen said she could feel a ghostly presence and be embraced by it. All of this and more caused the family to flee in fear after only staying in the house for 28 days. Due to this, demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren visited the house and set up time-lapse infrared cameras and caught this photo. This picture wasn't made public until three years later when George Litz appeared on the Merv Griffith show in 1979. Believers of the haunting thinks that the photo is a ghost of the youngest Defoe son, John Matthew, who was nine at the time of the Others believe it's a staged photo, but despite the controversy, this picture is one of the most frightening images from the Amityville horror. Number 2. Man Falling From The Ceiling Back in the 1950s, the Cooper family from Texas moved into their new house. Once there, they took a family photo. Normal, right? But when the picture was developed, the image of a body falling from the ceiling was clearly visible. To be clear, no one fell from the ceiling when they took the photo. So what happened? As further investigation on this story has brought no plausible explanation, there exists many speculations, including one that argues that the shadow is the ghost of the previous owner of the house. But my question is, why is he falling from the ceiling, and why did he have to ruin that beautiful family photo? I remember seeing this photo on the internet when I was probably too young to see it, and after all these years, this image still gives me the chills. And number one, a collection of things. I don't even know how to go on to describe this photo. It's a collection of things, but you can't really make out what any of the things are. At first glance, it appears normal, but upon closer inspection, it is incredibly difficult to make out any object, as everything is blurred to the point of being indistinct. Your brain is trying hard to grasp some sort of pattern to understand the context of the photo, and it looks so much like there is context to be found, but it's simply impossible. The photo is named, name one thing in this photo, and it was made by someone unknown. Many people have described this as what you see when you're having a stroke, but has not been released to what this is or why it was made. All I can say is, is that it makes me wildly uncomfortable and I'd love it if it were deleted off the internet forever. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the reenactment. This photo is extremely unsettling and for a very good reason. If when you look at this photo, your instincts tell you that the guy in them is creepy, Ding, ding, ding. You're right. This is a photo that features the German serial killer Joachim Kroll. He is known for taking the lives of 14 people, all varying in age. This monster was caught in 1976, and he was discovered when police found out that he had clogged the plumbing in his apartment with remains of one of his victims. How gruesome is that? This photo was taken shortly after he was caught and arrested, and what you're seeing is Kroll reenacting one of his crimes for the police. I get goosebumps just thinking about that. I couldn't imagine being there or being the police officer he's on top of. 
talk about terrifying. I'm just glad that they caught him and got him off of the street. In our number nine spot today, we have the Pioneer's Defense. This photo is known as the Pioneer's Defense and man, does it ever look creepy. This photo comes from 1937 and it was taken by a Russian photographer named Viktor Bulla. This photo takes place in the Leningrad area, which is now known as St. Petersburg, which is the second largest city in Russia. The people in this photo were part of a group that was the 1930s Russian equivalent of our Boy Scouts that was called the Young Pioneers. The masks on their faces leaves a very eerie feeling and for a fair reason. These people were doing a military preparation drill, which is the reason for the gas masks. This photo was taken during a time when the country was under the dictatorship of Joseph Stalin and the residents were constantly unsure of what was going to happen. The country was already seeing death and people were already frightened just a few years before the start of World War II, and those in this photo felt the need to be prepared for the worst case scenario. In our number 8 spot today, we have the net test. This photo comes to us from 1958, and it is quite an interesting one. At a first glance, it looks fun, but then when you catch the expression on the person's face and look a little more into it, it really just leaves you with a ton of questions as to what exactly is going on here. It looks like a guy is going on some sort of a roller coaster ride, but what is actually happening is that a prisoner is being used to test safety nets before they were mass produced. Yeah, not the good time we thought it was. This comes from a time where capital punishment was much more widespread throughout the United States and those waiting on death row couldn't just sit around waiting for their day to come. I think it's probably best that we made the switch to crash test dummies and that sort of thing, and this photo just remains as an eerie reminder of the less than great choices that were made in the past. In our number 7 spot today, we have a burst of joy. You might be looking at this photo wondering how this extremely joyous photo could hold any dark secrets. Well, this photo won a Pulitzer Prize and for a good reason. This photo was captured by Slava Vetter on March 17, 1973 at the Travis Air Force Base in California. This photo shows United States Air Force Lieutenant Robert L. Sturm and his family. This was taken as he was being reunited with his family after five years of being held as a prisoner of war in North Vietnam. On October 27, 1967, he was leading a flight of F-105s when he was shot down over Hanoi and held captive until March 14th, 1973. I can't imagine what this must have been like for his family because there was a huge chance that he could have not come home at all. The looks on their faces of course clearly show that this photo is capturing an exceptionally joyful moment. It's just the story behind this moment that leaves us all with that unsettling feeling. In our number six spot today, we have Ghost Boy. This photo is said to have been taken inside of the infamous Amityville Horror House in 1976. It is said that this creepy vintage photo is still one of the most chilling paranormal photos of all time. Yep, that's right, this photo is said to be of a ghost. After the DeFeo killing, the next owner of the house, George Lutz, swore that the house was haunted and he called in none other than Ed and Lorraine Warren, the most famous paranormal investigators ever. On one night of the investigations, they set up an automatic camera on the second floor of the house and this photo is said to have been caught then. Some believe that the ghostly face staring back is that of a young John DeFoe who lost his life in this house. I'm not 100% sure either way, but what I am sure of is that if this is actually a photo of a ghost and not a real person, that is ridiculously creepy. In our number 5 spot today, we have a UFO report. This is less of a photo and is actually more like a PDF, but I still felt like it applied to today's list. This is a previously classified document from 1963. Although the document still has a ton of information that has been blacked out, the document is the description and report of an unidentified flying object or a UFO encounter. This is said to have taken place over the desert of Nevada, and the report was written in detail in order to have a written record of the event. This document is said to have been the authentic report from the FBI, which is exactly why some of the details have still been omitted. This might seem like less of a big deal now, as in this day and age we have declassified video footage of similar kinds of encounters, but for 1963 this was huge. As discussions of alien or extraterrestrial life is a big part of our modern day society, this document shows that these things have been on our minds for many, many years now. In our number 4 spot today, we have the Apollo 1 prayer. 
This photo was originally taken and meant to be a sort of lighthearted prank or joke, but it would later turn out to be a chilling image. This photo shows the Apollo 1 crew jokingly praying over a miniature model of their command module. The three men in the photo are Roger Chaffee, Virgil Grissom, and Ed White. To make this story even worse, prior to the test, the three of them had voiced concerns about the amount of flammable material that was on the craft. The fire was determined to have been caused by an electrical fault, and it spread extremely quickly due to combustion nylon material coupled with the high-pressure pure oxygen atmosphere in the cabin. They also were unable to be rescued or escape because the plug door hatch couldn't be opened against the internal pressure of the cabin. Before this test, it was believed that since there was no fuel on the rocket, it would be relatively safe, which is exactly why there wasn't more preparedness in case of emergency. Looking back now, this photo is certainly more mysterious than anyone at the time could have ever imagined. In our number three spot today, we have the Hilo Tsunami. This photo comes to us from April 1st, 1946. This is the day when an 8.6 magnitude earthquake hit just off of the coast of the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. As we all know, earthquakes can often have after effects, and this one sent shockwaves throughout the Pacific. This led to the formation of an ocean-wide tsunami that had waves reaching up to 13 stories high. This disaster went on to strike Hilo, Hawaii, in what became one of the worst disasters in Hawaiian history. This photo somehow survived the disaster and it captures the terrifying view someone must have had in their last moments. This photo is especially chilling to view just days after the Tonga volcano eruption occurred. The earth and these naturally occurring disasters are absolutely terrifying and powerful and unpredictable. In our number two spot today, we have the shadows. As most of us know, on August 6th, 1945, the United States dropped an atomic on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. This was devastating to the city, and of course we can understand the implications of this. This photo shows what is called a nuclear shadow, and this is just one that could be seen throughout the city. When the bomb detonated 1,900 feet above the center of the city, the explosion caused temperatures of 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit to spread through everything within 1,600 feet of it. This of course destroyed nearly everything and everyone within a mile of it. The light and heat from the bomb was so powerful that it bleached the exposed surfaces of the city, except as seen here, where an unsuspecting person was shielding the surface with their own body. It is truly such an eerie reminder of the impact that this really had. In our number one spot today, we have the crash. This is one of those photos that was just taken in the right place at the right time, but it shows a very scary situation. A man named Jim Meads is said to have taken this photo in 1962. The story goes that a man named Bob Sowray had mentioned to Jim that he was going to fly this plane, called the Lightning, the following day. Jim took his kids out for a walk that next day and took his camera with him, intending to get a shot of the aircraft as Bob flew it. He wanted to get a photo of his children with the airfield in the background just as the plane was coming in to land. They found the spot, they got all set up, just waiting for the plane to return. Turns out that day Bob didn't fly the plane and instead the pilot was actually a man named George Aird who was another test pilot. So George is up in the plane and he realizes that there's trouble. Since I don't know plane language, I'm gonna use this quote from fearoflanding.com, which wrote, quote, whilst carrying out a demonstration flight, there was a fire in the aircraft's reheat zone. Unburnt fuel in the rear fuselage had been ignited by a small crack in the jet pipe and had weakened the tailplane actuator anchorage. This weakened the tailplane control system, which failed with the aircraft at 100 feet on final approach. This led to the plane pitching up aggressively as George came into land. George lost control and he ejected in order to save himself. Luckily, since the nose had pitched up, he had just enough time. The tractor driver in this photo was then 15-year-old Mike Sutterby, who had spent that summer working on this airfield. He wasn't actually posing, he was telling Jim to move since he wasn't supposed to be there before turning to look at what was happening behind him. This is all what led to this photo being snapped and this story surviving all of these years. In the end, George was okay, aside from some minor injuries, and while Jim didn't get the photo he set out for that day, he still got quite an interesting one. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have a pile of bones. During the 19th century, bison were hunted so much that they were actually quite close to being extinct, and by the mid-1880s, there were only a few hundred left. Hides were prepared and then shipped off so that they could be made into leather, but usually the bones, or really anything other than the hide, was just left to decay, as it wasn't useful 
to the hunters. The hunting of bison was so widespread and overwhelming that even the US Army sanctioned and endorsed the slaughter of herds of bison. The federal government was promoting it for a variety of reasons, including to lessen a food and material source for the indigenous peoples. The US government was even paying a bounty for each bison skull, and military commanders were ordering troops to kill bison, not for them to eat, but just so that the indigenous couldn't. That story coupled with the sheer mass amounts of skulls seen in this photo is exactly what makes it so exceptionally unsettling. These bones would likely be on their way to become fertilizer. In our number 9 spot today we have the Great Manta. In 1933, a New York silk manufacturer named A. L. Kahn was on a nice little vacation in Florida when he honestly accidentally caught something remarkable. His anchor line, by mistake, caught onto a giant manta ray. After a struggle and several hours, Kahn was able to get this actually enormous fish ashore. This monster was somewhere between 5,000 to 6,000 pounds and was 20 feet and 5 inches in width. For reference, there are other giant manta rays, but they usually grow to be around 13 to 14 feet wide, not 20 and a half. This photo is showing a taxidermy version of the fish which Khan used to bring around to exhibitions to show off his accidental catch. In an article from the December 10th, 1933 issue of the St. Louis Post Dispatch's Sunday magazine, Khan is quoted as saying, quote, fishing is a lot of fun when you catch the fish. And sometimes it's fun even when you don't, but when the fish catches you. In our number eight spot today, we have the swimsuits. This is a photo that comes to us from the 1920s, and it shows just one of the many extremely important jobs that the quote, beach patrol of the day had. Yes, they went around measuring the length between a woman's knee and the bottom of her swimsuit because God forbid she showed too much leg at the beach. In the 1920s, bathing suits began to become something that went through changes and fads, and of course this evolution to more form-fitting, less material swimwear caused a lot of controversy in the day. There were then strict dress codes implemented at places like resorts and country clubs, and even directors of public beaches had them, thus the beach patrol. There were fines for violations, and sometimes even imprisonment. In the Washington Post in 1907, there was a photo of two women in bathing suits being escorted by an officer with a caption quote, these apologies for skirts endanger the morals of the children. The police must interfere and stop the outrageous proceedings. In most cases, these sorts of rules really only affected the women of the time, and sometimes women were even required to wear stockings under their bathing suits. I'm just saying, with my attitude, I would have not done well in the 1920s. There was even one beach who had a tailor go around and stitch up swimsuits that they felt weren't up to the dress code. In our number 7 spot today, we have the advertisement. This is a photo that comes to us from a time of World War II and it shows a terrifying ad. The sign reads, these men didn't take their atabrine. And at first, I had absolutely no idea what that was. Turns out adabrine is the first synthetic form of quinine which was used by the US military to fight malaria in the South Pacific during the war. It is estimated that as many as two thirds of the troop fell ill with malaria. This sign is said to have been posted outside of a military hospital in New Guinea and was meant to serve as a warning for those who didn't take the medicine, warning that the skulls on top would be the fate that awaited them. Perhaps a little dark, but creative and likely effective nonetheless. At the very least, the ad is quite clear. In our number six spot today, we have the Ferris Wheel of Hate. This is a photo that, honestly, I don't even know what to say about it. It's gross, it's weird, it's upsetting, and it's honestly just so stupid. For a long time, this photo went under the radar as the photographer who took it didn't share it with the paper, but when it resurfaced 65 years later, it spread like wildfire, and for a lot different reasons than it would have back then, thankfully, but it also reveals some of those blind spots in history that we have. This photo comes from April of 1926, and it shows some members of the KKK just enjoying a day at an amusement park with many of them on a Wheel. I wish this was one of those times where something went horribly wrong and the whole thing came crashing down, but unfortunately that likely isn't what happened on this day, and now we just have this relic that shows us the insane power and influence that this hate group had during this time. While this photo is very dark, it's an important part of history to remember. Also, before we move on, let's just take a second to talk about how stupid they all look. Like, we gotta wear our little matching outfits to the Ferris wheel. In our number 5 spot today, we have early plastic surgery. This photo, well, rather these two photos side by side, show a man named Walter Yo, and he was the first person to receive the, at the time advanced, plastic surgery procedure called the skin flap. 
Sounds disgusting. He received this procedure in 1917, and at the time, since it was so advanced, it was only used for very serious things, like for someone who was wounded in battle, which is exactly what had happened to Walter. He was a soldier in the Battle of Jutland during the First World War. Walter was actually a sailor, and he was manning the guns aboard the HMS Warspite, and while doing this, he sustained facial injuries that included the loss of his upper and lower eyelids. In the end, he needed a couple more operations, but he was even able to return to service for a little while before being medically discharged. After this, he lived his life until he reached the age of 70 years old. In our number four spot today, we have the Hindenburg. This is a photo that was taken during what is now known as the Hindenburg disaster. It is commonly known that blimps or these kinds of floating airships use helium in them to float through the air, and it's important to note that this helium isn't the choice because it's the only option, but rather it's one of the safest options because it isn't extremely volatile. Because of a US ban on the exportation of helium at the time, i.e. the Helium Control Act of 1925, although the Hindenburg was designed to use helium because of a lack of it available, on the day of the Hindenburg disaster, the much more flammable hydrogen was used instead. This led to a complete disaster. When the Hindenburg floated off on May 6, 1937, it disastrously caught fire during its flight with 97 people on board. Sadly, due to the fire, there were 35 casualties on board the flight that day. It is an absolutely horrendous situation, but it does teach us all a very valuable lesson. In our number three spot today, we have the falls. This is a photo of Annie Edison Taylor when she was 63 years old in 1901. The barrel she is posing beside is the one that she sealed herself up inside of to then become the first person to survive a trip over Niagara Falls. Why did she do this? Well, for money, of course. Annie was widowed and spent a lot of time bouncing between different jobs, but after having been burned out of her home and losing money that she had invested with a clergyman, she ended up sadly falling on some hard times, and this is what led her to the falls. The barrel she used was custom made, and it was constructed of oak and iron and padded with a mattress. It wasn't exactly easy to get this whole plan set up, and it ended up being delayed several times, mostly because people were afraid to be a part of this mission that was likely sending Annie to her death, and I truly don't blame them at all. On October 24th, 1901, her 63rd birthday, Annie climbed in the barrel with her heart-shaped pillow and was set adrift. The river currents carried the barrel over the Canadian Horseshoe Falls, and rescuers reached her barrel shortly after. She was alive and escaped with little to no injuries aside from a gash on her head. While her survival is great news, it's important to include what Annie had to say about the entire situation after, which was, quote, If it was with my dying breath, I would caution anyone against attempting the feet. I would sooner walk up to the mouth of a cannon knowing it was going to blow me to pieces than make another trip over the falls. So don't try this at home is what she's saying. In our number two spot today we have War is Hell. This is a photo of a soldier that was taken during the Vietnam War. The soldier has a hand scribed note on their helmet that reads quote, war is hell and I truly cannot even imagine. In 1954 the US entered the war to support South Vietnam against the regime in North Vietnam as well as their allies in the South. This war lasted for two decades and it claimed more than three million lives, mostly those of Vietnamese civilians. There are many, many powerful, disturbing, and unsettling photos from this war, many of which I would consider too graphic to put here on YouTube. There is something about the brightness of the eyes of the soldier that sits in contrast with the rest of this dark photo that really make it stand out. For a while, the identity of the soldier was left a mystery, but after some years, Fran Chafin Morrison revealed that the soldier was her late husband, Larry Wayne Chaffin. Larry served for a year in the 173rd Brigade, beginning in May 1965, and when this photo was taken, he was just 19 years old. He did end up being discharged from the army and was able to return home to his wife. He sadly ended up passing away at the young age of 39, thought to be because of complications due to the exposure to Agent Orange but his legacy has lived on. There is an incredible photo of his grandson who looks strikingly similar to his grandfather, holding this exact portrait. In our number one spot today, we have the cross. This photo comes to us from 1960, and it shows Martin Luther King Jr., along with his infant son at the time, removing a cross that had been burnt on his front lawn. This photo is important and powerful for quite a few reasons. Firstly, it's just a glimpse into what Mr. King would have dealt with every single day for many years. It is clear by his almost nonchalant look that this isn't something new or surprising. It's also important to note, however, that this look isn't one of acceptance or content, or of someone who is unbothered, but instead it's the look of someone who continually chooses to rise above, someone who chooses to remain calm 
and cool in the face of adversity. The leader of a movement. As a Reddit user, 1945 best year put so well, quote, here he's a father, a man with a family whose lives are being threatened. He isn't hysterical or obviously afraid, and his towering figure literally rooting out the undesirable foe has been done in any number of war propaganda posters, but he's still sympathetic. He deserves the security of knowing that home will be safe for his children like anybody else. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Radium Girls. At a first glance, this photo really doesn't look like anything is going on. Basically just an old photo of some women of the past working, but there is something extremely disturbing actually going on. The Radium Girls were factory workers who were made to use radium filled paint that they were told was harmless. This self luminous paint was being used to paint watch dials, and the women were given no protection at all, and again told that the paint was completely safe. So much so that they were actually instructed to use their lips to help point the tip of the paintbrush in order to give a fine line. Yeah, this turned out horrible when the women realized that they all had ingested deadly amounts of radiation. The injuries they suffered as well as the poisonings were horrible, with dentists being the first to notice that something was seriously wrong when the women were turning up with dental pain, loose teeth, lesions, and ulcers. The first of the radium girls to die happened in 19 1923, and before her death, her jaw fell off of her face. That's how bad this was. By the next year, 50 of the women were seriously ill, and over a dozen had already passed away. And to make matters even worse, of course the companies tried to cover up their wrongdoing. So much so that they tried to smear the name of the women who had passed away, claiming that syphilis was actually the reason for their passing. In the end, once the inventor of the radium dial paint, Sabin A. von Schockocki, died in November of 1928, becoming the 16th known victim of poisoning by radium dial paint, the claims of these women were taken much more seriously. He had gotten sick from radium in his hands, not the jaw, but the circumstances of his death helped the radium girls in court. In our number 9 spot today we have The Attic. This photo is of Otto Frank, and the extremely somber energy of it truly is almost palpable. Otto was the father of Anne Frank, and this photo was taken in a moment where he was revisiting the attic where he and his family once had to hide. This would be an incredible difficult and powerful moment, and it is, but because of the fact that Otto was the only member of his family to survive the war, the true tragedy is even more prominent. The photographer who took the picture, Arnold Newman, said of the encounter where he took it, quote, The mood was depressing and I immediately began photographing him. After a few moments, the Wester Torin bells next door began to ring and Frank turned to me and said, Those were the bells that Anne wrote about. He suddenly broke down completely, weeping uncontrollably, and then so did I. We never met again. To this day, when I lecture or tell this story to people, I find I choke up. I still can't help myself. In our number 8 spot today, we have the swimming pool protest. This photo definitely shows quite a bleak spot in history, but I really do believe that it's important to look at these moments and remember them in all of their horrific nature to ensure that we only progress forwards. This photo shows a manager of a motel, the Monson Motor Motel, and this manager is named James Brock. In the photo, you see him dumping some sort of liquid into the motel pool as people swim. And this photo was taken on June 18th, 1964. What James is pouring into the pool is actually muriatic acid, which is similar to hydrochloric acid, and he's pouring that into the pool in order to try and get the people who were swimming in it out. This photograph was taken by Horace Court and was connected to the St. Augustine movement, which at the time was a lot of peaceful protests and demonstrations that took place, which unfortunately ended up erupting into violence. On June 11th, 1964, just a week before this photo was taken, Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested at this same motel after he had been asked to leave the segregated restaurant. This arrest is what led to a group of protesters planning an event where they would jump into the pool in order to try and end segregation at motel pools. This pool was considered a quote, whites only pool, so when he saw these protesters standing up for themselves and swimming in the pool, this was the route he took to try and get them out. Times like these definitely show us that things were incredibly different not that long ago, but there is always more work to be done. In our number 7 spot today, we have the treatment program. This photo is said to have been taken all the way back in 1890, and it comes from a treatment center in Germany. The photo shows a woman who appears to be tied with her arms outstretched to the sides, as well as having her 
feet shackled in place as she is made to face a wall. This photo apparently is of someone who is undergoing treatment for their mental health. This sounds wild, but forced standing actually used to be a legitimate treatment for people exhibiting signs of mental illness in this time. Forced standing. I'm really not sure how anyone ever thought that this would help, but hey. There are definitely stranger medical practices in history. Considering the time period of when this photo came from, it is also extremely unclear as to whether or not this woman was actually struggling with her mental health. In history, people, especially women, could be considered mentally unwell for doing things like reading or being independent. And when taking that into consideration, the photo definitely becomes even more eerie, although it was definitely chilling without the story behind it. In our number six spot today, we have the house of a monster. This photo was taken from the in side of serial killer Ed Gein's house where he once used to live with his mother. If you're not familiar, Ed was an absolute monster and is actually the basis for many horror movies today because of how terrible his crimes were. Inside of his home, authorities not only found different household items that were made out of body parts, some from the victims of his crimes, and some from the graves he would go and search and snatch from. The photos that were taken from the inside of his home only scratched the surface of the horrors that were found inside. For a while, for some unknown known reasons, it was thought that they might use the house as a tourist attraction, but thankfully the house ended up burning down, and I truly feel glad that it doesn't exist anymore. If it did though, would you have gone? In our number 5 spot today, we have The Challenger. This is a series of two photos, and one after another they paint a horrible story that we will definitely never forget. The first photo shows a clearly very excited Challenger crew as they walk down the ramp ready to head off on their mission. The crew even included 37-year-old Krista McAuliffe, who was a high school social studies teacher. She had won a spot on this mission through a program with NASA called the Teacher in Space program, and she had trained diligently for months in order to be the first non-military person in space. On January 28th, 1986, the Challenger mission proved to be fateful just 73 seconds after liftoff. Two rubber O-rings failed because of the cold temperatures of the morning, and on live television, the world watched as the spacecraft broke apart and plunged into the ocean, sadly taking the lives of everyone on board the craft. It is an absolutely tragic event, made even more chilling by this final photo of the crew, as well as the photos that show the explosion as it happened. In our in number 4 spot today, we have The Fire. This is a photo that comes to us from 2003 at the Station nightclub in Rhode Island, and it shows the band Great White as they perform. While this seems like just a regular photo that someone took on their Motorola Razor, what ensued shortly after this photo was taken is absolutely tragic. Basically, as the band performed, there were some pyrotechnics that you can see in the photo, and they were set off. And while this was meant to be a spectacular display, it only ended in disaster. The fireworks ended up setting all of the flammable acoustic foam in the walls and ceiling on fire, and within one minute, everything that was combustible was up in flames. Within two minutes, the entire club was fully engulfed in black smoke, and people were having trouble finding exits. In the end, this fire took the lives of 100 people, and another 230 were injured as a result. It has gone down in US history as one of the worst and most deadly nightclub fires. In our number three spot today, we have the pile of bones. During the 19th century, bison were hunted so much that they were actually quite close to being extinct, and by the mid-1880s, there were only a few hundred left. Hides were prepared and then shipped off so that they could be made into leather, but usually the bones, or really everything other than the hide, was just left to decay as it wasn't, quote, useful to the hunters. The hunting of bison was so widespread and overwhelming that even the U.S. Army sanctioned and endorsed the slaughter of herds of bison. The federal government was promoting it for a variety of reasons, including to lessen a food and material source for the indigenous peoples. The US government was even paying a bounty for each bison skull and military commanders were ordering troops to kill bison, not for them to eat, but just so that the indigenous couldn't. That story, coupled with the sheer mass amounts of skulls seen in this photo, is exactly what makes it so exceptionally unsettling. These bones would likely be on their way to become fertilizer. In our number two spot today, we have the Hindenburg. This is a photo that was taken during what is now known as the Hindenburg disaster. 
Earth. It is commonly known that blimps or these kinds of floating airships use helium in them to float through the air, and it's important to note that helium isn't the choice because it's the only option, but rather it's one of the safest options because it isn't extremely volatile. Because of a US ban on the exportation of helium at the time, i.e. the Helium Control Act of 1925, although the Hindenburg was designed to use helium, because of a lack of it available on the day of the Hindenburg disaster, a much more flammable hydrogen was used. This led to complete disaster. When the Hindenburg floated off on May 6, 1937, it disastrously caught fire during its flight. Sadly, due to the fire, there were 35 casualties on board the flight that day. It is an absolutely horrendous situation, which teaches us all a very valuable lesson. In our number one spot today, we have the falls. This is a photo of Annie Edson Taylor when she was 63 years old in 1901. The barrel she is posing beside is the one that she sealed herself up inside of to then become the first person to survive a trip over Niagara Falls. Why did she do this? Well, for money, of course. Annie was widowed and spent a lot of time bouncing between different jobs, but after having been burned out of her home and losing money that she had invested with a clergyman, she ended up sadly falling on some very hard times, and this is what led her to the falls. The barrel she used was custom made, and it was constructed of oak and iron and padded with a mattress. It wasn't exactly easy to get this whole plan set up, and it ended up being delayed several times, mostly because people were afraid to be a part of this mission that was likely sending Annie to her death, and I truly don't blame them at all. On October 24th, 1901, her 63rd birthday, Annie climbed in the barrel with her heart-shaped pillow and was set adrift. The river currents carried the barrel over the Canadian Horseshoe Falls, and rescuers reached her barrel shortly after. She was alive and escaped with little to no injuries aside from a gash on her head. While her survival is great news, it's important to include what Annie had to say about the entire situation after, which was, quote, If it was with my dying breath, I would caution anyone against Against attempting this feat. I would sooner walk up to the mouth of a cannon knowing it was going to blow me to pieces than make another trip over the falls. So uh, don't try this at home. I think is what she's saying. At number 10, parkour gone wrong. I'm sure you've all seen an example of parkour before, but I would personally describe it as people launching themselves from one spot to the next, avoiding injury by the skin of their teeth. Often done outdoors, some of the maneuvers these people do are seemingly impossible. While it takes a lot of practice and coordination, this sport can also be super dangerous. Parkour daredevils like to take things quite literally to the next level, and as heights get higher and tricks get more more technical, disasters not far behind. Pavel Kashin was a Russian parkour artist who unfortunately learned his lesson the hard way. In 2013, he was performing a stunt on the rooftop of a 16 story building with a friend filming. They ended up capturing the final moments of Kashin's life. He was one of the well known parkour artists or free runners, being named one of the best in the world. He was known for his breakthrough stunts, which you can still find videos of today. On the day of his passing, Kashin was standing on a three foot wide lead on the top of an apartment building. The daredevil decided to do a backflip on this very small ledge, with him completing the trick only to lose his footing on the landing and be sent over the edge. Kashin's fans and fellow members of the parkour community showed their support and sent respects to his family. His friends uploaded the final image of Pavel mid-flip with the permission of his parents to the web. Kashin's parents hoped that the image would deter others from doing the same as their son. Number 9. Wind Turbine Fire If you have ever seen a wind turbine in real life before, you will know just how massive the energy converting monsters actually are. In October 2013, two workers were doing routine maintenance to a 67 meter high turbine in Oltensplat, Netherlands. Don't come for me, I know I butchered that name, but while they were doing this maintenance, a fire broke out quickly engulfing the only escape route, trapping the workers high above the ground. Due to the height of the fire, the firefighters had a hard time reaching the fire to put it out, so a specialized crew of firefighters were called in with a large crane. Unfortunately, this took hours, which the technicians did not have. In their last moments, a photo of the tragedy was snapped, and in it you can see the turbine in a blaze, but you can also see the two workers embracing in their final moments. The image just amplifies how big the turbine actually is and shows how hopeless a rescue mission would have been. The men were just 19 and 21 at the time. One tried one last effort to survive, with one man jumping from the wind turbine in the last effort to save himself, and the other tried to scale down the side, only to be caught up in the blaze. The man who jumped was found in a field next to the turbine, and the other was found when firefighters were able to finally climb to the turbine. The cause of the fire is unknown, but believed to be a short circuit. While this freak 
freak accident ended up taking two lives, the tragedy led to a political inquiry into safety precautions for wind turbine maintenance crews. Their final photo together was sad, but it was nice that in their final moments they did have each other. Number 8 Racing to Disaster Gary Box was one of the many firefighters who was there on 9 11, risking it all in order to save lives. Unfortunately, he was also one of the many who never made it home after that day. Hours before heroically losing his life, Box was photographed racing towards the disaster. The image was taken in the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel by a pedestrian in their car. Their engine got stuck in the traffic of the tunnel, so in full gear carrying as much as they could, Box and the rest of his crew started running on foot to ground zero. Gary was 35 at the time and his remains were never recovered. All images taken that day I'm sure have something haunting about them, but knowing how little time he had left is another level. At number 7, Rinaldo Dexa. He was a Filipino politician, a member of the peacekeeping action team, and a corporal in the Philippine Army Reserve Command. Now this photo is not of Dagsa before he passed, but due to how haunting it is, I still had to include it. His passing achieved notoriety due to the picture he snapped of his family on New Year's with unbelievable timing. The image Dagsa captured also inadvertently captured the man who was about to take the shot that would ultimately take his life. The photo was extremely helpful when it came to investigators identifying the shooter because the image shows the gunman quite literally seconds before taking the fatal shot. The picture was taken outside the councilman's house in metropolitan Manila. The photo led to a quick arrest of the shooter as well as his accomplice. Apparently the suspects were known car thieves out on bail, likely holding a grudge against Dexa who had the men arrested a year earlier. It is extremely sad that Dexa unknowingly captured his own final moments, especially with his family being right there, but at least they were able to use it to catch the gunman. Number 6. Discount Flight Keith Sapsard was from Randwick, New South Wales. He passed away just 14 years old with his final moments caught on camera. On February 22, 1970, the teen snuck onto the tarmac at Sydney Airport in Australia with the idea to hide inside a Tokyo bound plane in order to run away. Unfortunately, Sapsford would never make it to Tokyo. His father described Keith as a curious kid who always had an urge to keep on the move. Due to his restlessness, his parents decided to send him to Boys Town, a Roman Catholic institution specializing in troubled children, for some discipline and structure. Instead, Sapsford escaped from the facility after a couple weeks and headed to the airport. Thanks to the far more relaxed regulations and security of the 70s, Sapsford was able to sneak onto the tarmac with ease. It's unknown if Keith knew where the plane was headed, but he saw a plane preparing for boarding and climbed into its wheel well. It took a few hours for the plane to take off, but eventually it made its way to the sky. What Keith didn't know was that the plane was going to reopen the wheel compartments to retract the wheels. When this happened, Sapsford fell out of the plane, falling 200 feet. One of the craziest things about this tragic event was by pure coincidence. Photographer John Gilpin was simply taking pictures at the airport when he unknowingly snapped a pic at the exact same time Sapsford was falling from the plane. I bet when he developed that roll of film, he was totally surprised. His father later said, All my son wanted to do was see the world. He had itchy feet and his determination to see how the rest of the world lives cost him his life. Obviously, what happened to Keith was a tragedy, but the photo captured by Gilpin is remarkable as well as haunting. At number 5, Fatal Friend Brittany Gargle and Cheyenne Antoine were the best of friends until they weren't. Apparently, Brittany was extremely hardworking. At 16, she was juggling school and two jobs. Antoine had a rough upbringing with her parents falling into substance use. Cheyenne grew up in foster care. At 15, Antoine's mother passed away, and to cope with the news, she got involved with some dangerous company, also falling into substance use. That's when the two girls met, and Brittany helped Cheyenne manage her feelings, and the two became close. On March 25, 2015, Brittany posted a picture of her and Cheyenne on social media. The two planned to go out for drinks and have fun, but as the night went on, things got out of hand and the details became fuzzy. The girls traveled to a pub, then to a house party, and then one more pub. Cheyenne claimed that around 4 a.m., Brittany asked a man for a lighter and invited him for drinks, but she didn't know what happened later. Cheyenne heard nothing from Brittany the next day, and later the police received a 911 call of a woman lying on her back, cold to the touch. The woman was identified as Brittany. Cheyenne was questioned and her story checked out, but the police thought she was hiding something. As the police dug further, more details came out. In the end, Brittany's passing was ruled a strangling, and this led to oh my god, and this led them to a crucial lead. It was the picture Cheyenne had posted on social.
social media the night of the event. In it, Cheyenne was wearing a stylish black belt, the same belt that had been found at the crime scene. In 2017, after all the evidence collected, Cheyenne was arrested for taking Britney's life, with Cheyenne claiming not to remember anything due to the substances. In the end, Cheyenne was sentenced to seven years in prison with her release in 2024. At number four, the final dive. Nicholas Mavoli was an American free diver who passed doing what he loved, but not before taking a picture that will give you the chills. Mavoli began free diving competitively in 2012, winning titles twice at the Deja Blue competition and finishing third at the Caribbean Cup in Honduras. With much success in his newfound passion, Mavoli only wanted to take things even further. On November 15, 2013, he prepared to dive into Dean's Blue Hole, hoping to reach 72 meters on a single inhalation with no fins or supplemental oxygen. Surrounded by 15 other athletes and observers, as well as five safety divers, he submerged face first, looking like a human arrow diving into the darkness that would ultimately end up being his last dive. Mike Board, free diving record holder, said diving into a depth with no fins, that's a hard physical dive. I was thinking, okay, he's going to have a hard time getting up. Yet, after a dive of 3 minutes and 38 seconds, Mavoli shot back up to the surface. Unfortunately, instead of celebrating the dive, things quickly turned into a nightmare. Mavoli ripped off his goggles, flashed the OK sign, and attempted to complete surface protocol that would make the attempt official by saying, I am OK. But he wasn't. His words came out jumbled and his eyes were wide and blank. This moment was captured on camera and the blank fear in the diver's eyes is frightening. He lost consciousness and never regained it after suffering a pulmonary edema. Number 3. Dytlov Pass Mystery The Dytlov Pass incident was the event in which nine Soviet trekkers passed away in the northern Ural Mountains between February 1st and 2nd, 1959, in uncertain circumstances. There are many theories as to what caused the tragedy, but ultimately, it's a mystery. The experienced trekking group from the Yuri Polytechnic Institute was led by Igor Dytlov. Overnight, something seemingly caused the group to cut their way out of their tent from inside and flee the campsite. While them cutting open their tent from the inside is confusing enough, the bodies found were improperly dressed for the heavy snowfall and the freezing temperatures. As the story goes on, things only get further from making sense. After the bodies were discovered, Soviet authorities determined that six had passed from hypothermia, while the other three suffered physical trauma. One had major skull damage, two severe chest trauma, and another had a small skull fracture. Four of the bodies were found lying in a creek, and three of those bodies had soft tissue damage to the head and face. Two bodies were missing missing eyes, one missing a tongue, and another had missing eyebrows. Now, if it had just been the hypothermia, this case would be totally different. But what the heck did all this physical damage in the middle of nowhere? While we aren't sure exactly what went down, there are lots of pictures of the group's final days as well as plenty of theories. There was a new investigation opened in 2019 calling it an avalanche, but I don't know still. Does an avalanche really remove your tongue and eyeballs? Number 2. A miracle of the Andes On October 13, 1972, Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571, chartered by an amateur rugby team, crashed into the Andes Mountains. The wreckage of the crash was not located for more than two months. There were only 16 out of 45 who survived the whole thing, with the incident gaining international attention after it was revealed the survivors had resorted to cannibalism. Due to the bad weather, the pilot of the plane misjudged their location, and the plane ended up striking a mountain, losing both wings before crashing into a remote valley of Argentina near the Chilean border. A search party was sent out, but due to the white plane on the white snow, it was unable to be spotted from above. After eight days, the search was called off, thinking there were no survivors, though later rescue efforts were taken over by family. There were initially 33 survivors, but due to the elements, injuries, and an avalanche, the numbers were shrinking. Several survivors surveyed the area for an escape route. On December 12th, almost exactly two months since the crash, three men set out to go find help. Though one did return to the crash site after a difficult trek, the other two men finally came across some people. It was December 20th now, and the people they found alerted the authorities. On December 22nd, six survivors were flown to safety, but bad weather meant the remaining eight waited 
until the 23rd. There are photos from both before the crash of the group. There are photos from both before the crash of the group on the plane and after of the group surrounding the fallen plane, as well as books and a movie about the incident. And at number one, a solo hike. In 2014, two women, Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon, were visiting Panama from the Netherlands, and on April 1st, they went on a walk through the scenic forest near the Baru volcano, only to never return. Alarm was raised the day after they didn't return from their hike, and a search party was sent out right away, only to find no sign of Kremers or Froon. A while later, a local woman found Froon's backpack. In the bag, they found her camera, two pairs of sunglasses, some cash, her passport, a water bottle, two bras, and both the women's phones. Probably the most concerning they found were the final images taken on the camera. All of the photos from April 1st are just the two women exploring the jungle. Then there are no pictures until April 8th, when 90 unsettling pictures were taken with the flash in the middle of the jungle, timestamp between 1 and 4 a.m. Most of these images are of complete darkness and the jungle floor, but there are two very alarming pics. One shows some of the women's belongings on a rock, and the other looks like the back of Kremer's head with what appears to be blood stain in her hair. Something else suspicious about the camera is that image 509 was missing, with 508 being the last of them looking okay, and image 510 being the first in the darkness days later. They found a pelvic bone and a foot still inside a boot. Froon's bones appeared to decompose naturally, but Kremer seemed to be stark white as if they'd been bleached, further leading to question if someone else was involved. And now, coming in at number 10, UFOs. Do you guys remember in April of 2020 when the Pentagon released UFO videos? The videos, captured by naval aviators, show objects flying through the sky, one rotating against the wind, and the pilots can be heard just being completely flabbergasted. When they first appeared online, they breathed new life into the decades long conversation about whether interstellar visitors had ever come to Earth, and extraterrestrial enthusiasts were more than a little excited about the whole thing. While the Pentagon has said that there are usually some more closer to home explanations for most occurrences like these, the Pentagon has never made any assertion about what exactly is going on in the videos. Recorded in 2004 and early 2015 over the Pacific and off the East Coast, they simply say that the phenomenon is unexplainable. I'm going to go ahead and say that there's nothing that proves these are aliens, and that's why these particular videos were released in the first place. I'm sure they've got more substantial evidence of aliens hiding somewhere. Number 9, Tank Man. The Tiananmen Square protests were student-led demonstrations in 1989 calling for democracy, free speech, and a free press in China. The amount of protesters began reaching into the millions, and when martial law had not deterred them, the government became much more hostile. On June 4th, military personnel and police began to storm the square using live rounds, with hundreds of thousands of casualties and 10,000 arrests. A man on June 5th, though, was photographed standing alone against and on top of a massive tank in the infamous square, and that image has circulated around the world. But it's likely that many people in China itself haven't seen much of it. That's because every year on the anniversary of the massacre, the Chinese government puts a massive amount of effort into making sure that there is not even a mention of it in the media or on the internet, as if the government would prefer to just erase it from history altogether. Number 8, X-37 Space Plane. Once upon a time, one of the most secretive advanced US experimental aircraft, the X-37B space plane, landed at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and the government did not want many pictures taken. The funny thing is that there are actually a lot of pictures of this event and of the craft itself, but what it's being used for or what its missions have been is the part that no one really knows. The autonomously piloted aircraft had just spent two years in our Earth's orbit on a highly classified mission. The craft looks like a miniature space shuttle, and it is launched into orbit using a secondary vehicle. It has had a few missions that prove that it is useful as a reusable space vehicle, which is the whole thing, but we don't know exactly what its purpose is or what technology it contains. Okay, number seven, Pine Gap. A video like this would not be a video like this if it didn't include a secret intelligence facility. Places like Joint Defense Facility Pine Gap, as an example. A US and Australian satellite surveillance base 18 kilometers southwest of the town of Alice Springs, Northern Territory, Australia. This base is a crucial facility for the United States monitoring of Asia, and they make very sure that basically no images of the site get out there. Obviously there are images, and there's also a TV show that is set 
set in the facility, but obviously the show speculates about the actual goings on because there are no photos that make it out of the facility for fear of having the technological capabilities of the surveillance base leaked to enemy powers. Even its location in the smack dab middle of Australia makes it too remote for spy ships passing in international waters to intercept the signals. While you can know what it looks like, people like you and me are very unlikely to ever know what it looks like on the inside. Number 6. Aoi Anagrio Base I have got another military base for you here. Google Earth is a wondrous thing. You can find just the silliest stuff on there, you can check out your child at home, and you can see landmarks from across the globe from the safety and comfort of your home. But one thing you can't do is take a look at the Greek Aoi Anagroi military base in central Athens. While other military bases are actually visible on Google Earth, the Greek government went an extra length by having any Google Earth images of this base blurred out. It's kind of strange to me because if you look at the images of the base, almost every single building is still visible, but obviously you can't see exactly what those buildings are used for, and maybe that's the point, because the base's operational capacity is also a tightly guarded secret. It's apparently supposed to be a training facility, but others have speculated that it's where Greek military command is situated. Number 5. Iranian Missile Failure Back in 2019, an Iranian missile test launch went incredibly wrong, destroying the facility where the launch took place. Enjoying the failure a bit more than you might suspect, President Trump shared a satellite surveillance image of the site on Twitter. An incredibly sharp satellite image, and that was the problem. Satellites are the best way to spy on other countries, and so the capabilities of those satellites are kept incredibly secret to avoid other countries developing countermeasures for this form of espionage. For example, using the photo shared by Trump, an astronomer was able to locate exactly which satellite was watching Iran when the test launch went downhill. USA-224, an optical reconnaissance satellite had the capability to take a clear enough photo to determine things that are 10 centimeters wide, meaning the photo itself showed that the satellite was one of the most powerful known surveillance systems ever made. Number 4. Nuclear Power Plants Back in 2016, pictures taken inside some of the USA's nuclear power plants were more than a little unsettling. As most of us know, nuclear power, while relatively clean and efficient, has the potential to be a huge problem when not handled correctly, like huge as in planet sized. The incident at the Chernobyl power plant, for example, eventually spread radiation over the entire globe thanks to the way that air works. So, when the 2016 pictures were released and showed some American power plants in completely awful states of disrepair, it was more than a little worrying. The pictures were shared in an effort by workers to try and get the facilities brought back up to code. But the worst part about this is that the pictures taken at a later date show some of the plants in the exact same state they were in in 2016. Unfortunately, more photos are very very unlikely to be seen as the government has made a point of being more thorough in choosing who and who can't get in. Number 3. North Korea I could probably fill this whole list with pictures from North Korea. Most people are aware of the fact that North Korea is under one of the strictest regimes in the world. Visitors to the country are escorted everywhere they go, and that's usually only to pre-vetted locations. Most trips try their best to avoid any areas of poverty, and there are some really weird rules about pictures. Like for example, it's okay to take pictures of statues of Kim, but not okay to take pictures of the statues from the rear. It's odd, but despite the regime's best efforts to limit documentation and pictures being leaked, a few have made it out thanks to crafty photographers. Looking through an album posted online, there are pictures of crowds of soldiers, pictures of kids on computers but with no electricity, soldiers helping on farms, people collecting grass for food, kids playing on almost empty streets, a subway tunnel, and an unfinished painting, and every single one of those those photos are illegal, and they aren't the worst of the bunch by any stretch of the imagination. Unfortunately, the photographer who took them has been banned from returning to North Korea once they realized that these pictures had made it onto the internet. Number 2. Mexican Asylum Plan During a press conference in June of 2019, Trump was speaking about a deal struck with the Mexican government that would avoid extra tariffs in order to make managing immigrants easier. It's by no means the biggest of security fumbles, but during the conference, Trump was waving around the folded and signed agreement just to show that it was indeed in the works. Now the problem came thanks to the sun. You see, it was a real sunny day in June 2019 when this conference was held, and so it illuminated through the 
paper and all the words of the confidential in the works agreement were visible for all to see, especially a photographer with a particularly high resolution camera. With the photo he captured, every single word in the document was visible and readable. It's not like this document would affect many people or anything. I guess the unsettling part is more the fact that this even happened in the first place. Number one, the Xinjiang internment camps. Heading back to both China and Google Maps for our number one spot is the Xinjiang internment camps. Operated by the government and the Chinese Communist Party Provincial Standing Committee, Human Rights Watch say that these camps are and have been used to indoctrinate and other Muslims since 2017, and the camps have been criticized by the governments of many countries and human rights organizations for alleged human rights violations. The camps are reportedly operated outside the Chinese legal system, with many people being interred without a trial and with no actual charges. Local authorities are reportedly holding hundreds of thousands of in these camps as well as members of other ethnic minority groups in China in order to apparently counter extremism and to quote, promote social integration. With all that, it's not really surprising that the area of the internment camps has been partly replaced with plain light gray tiles on Baidu maps and completely blurred in Google Maps and many countries have stood in opposition to the rounding up of at these camps. Starting off at number 10 now, we have the visitor. This one comes from a Reddit user called Fan and Depressed. They posted this picture with the caption, got a notification from my smart home app in the middle of the night saying, your doorbell detected a visitor. That's all he put and that's all that was needed. He posted it to the creepy subreddit but it has gained over 34,000 upvotes. One of the top comments said, why are you doing this? Because you were home. That's a quote from the movie Strangers where some twisted home invaders give their reason for terrorizing a woman woman in her home. It's a great movie and yeah, it does remind me of this too. Can you imagine how terrifying it would be to see this on your phone app in the middle of the night? There was no follow up story to this, I just hope they were alright. Next up at number 9 now we have the mummified captain. This is the disturbing story of Manfred Fritz Bajorat, a German man who was found in his boat by two fishermen off the coast of the Philippines. He was dead. His corpse had been preserved by dry ocean winds, hot temperatures and a salty sea air. It could not be determined how long he had been dead for but he hadn't been seen by anyone for 7 years years. He'd actually been sailing the world on his yacht for the past 20 years. It's thought that from the way he was sitting, death was unexpected, perhaps from a heart attack. The police said there was no evidence of a second person aboard and no weapon was found on board the yacht. Moving on to number 8 now, we have Home. This is a 1948 picture of a girl who grew up in a Nazi concentration camp. Now She was asked to draw what home was and this is what she drew. The photograph was taken by David Seymour in a home for emotionally disturbed children located in Warsaw. Not much is known about the girl other than her name, Teresa. The swirling lines are a stark reminder of horrors of the Holocaust. More than one and a half million Jewish children were killed in the Holocaust. Those that survived often ended up like Teresa, lost shocked and unable to grasp a simple concept like home. Moving on to number 7 now, we have Obsession. George Karl Tanzler was a radiology technician from Germany. He moved to Florida where he married Maria de Hoyos, a local Cuban American woman. She died of tuberculosis 5 years later despite his best efforts to save her. He wouldn't accept her death though. After her funeral, George dug up Maria's body and took her to his home. He attempted to preserve her. This is the picture of his efforts. He attached her bones together with wire and coat hangers and fitted her face with glass eyes. He replaced her skin with silk cloth soaked in wax. He gave her a wig and filled her insides with rags. He covered her in jewellery and the smell was masked with copious amounts of perfume. The body was eventually discovered by authorities a full 9 years after he first removed her from her resting place. Next up at number 6 now we have the catacombs. This is a very disturbing picture. Please look away now if you're sensitive to death and all that kind of thing. This is the story of Masha, a Ukrainian woman who went out with a large group of friends to celebrate New Year's Eve in 2005. It was a foggy night with temperatures around freezing. The group stumbled into the Odessa catacombs, an ancient tunnel and cave system that spans for over one and a half thousand miles. Somehow Masha became separated from her group and got lost in the dark. She seems to have wandered for days with no food or water before slipping into a coma and then death. Her body wasn't discovered for months 
until this picture was taken by some local boys who found her. Still, she wasn't retrieved by authorities for a further two years. When a story was shared on Reddit, people tried to imagine how terrifying it must be to be lost in the dark like that, pitch black darkness, unable to see any difference between your eyes being closed and open and totally alone. Moving on to number five now, we have shell shocked. In World War One, there were hundreds of thousands of soldiers who got shell shock, a type of PTSD brought on from the endless bombardment they had to endure. Tens of thousands of soldiers were treated for the disorder. Victims were said to have a thousand yard stare, looking into the distance as their mind went blank. Here is a famous picture from a soldier during the Battle of the Somme, a battle which killed three million men. This man appears to be suffering from shell shock. He has a crazed look in his eyes that is often associated with those who had shell shock. It's an image that has become increasingly associated with war, especially the hell that was World War One. Next up at number four now, we have the subway. In 2012, the New York Post ran a story with this picture. It was of Ki Suk Han, a 58 year old man who was pushed onto the tracks by a stranger. He was fatally struck by a train seconds later. The suspect was 30 year old Naeem Davis, who confessed to pushing the innocent man onto the tracks. The picture shocked New Yorkers and people around the world. Why was someone taking a picture instead of trying to help? Should the New York Post even have ran that story and published that picture? What do you guys think? Next up at number three now, we have Madame Violet. This is a picture of Violet Spears, otherwise known as Madame Violet. She was the leader of a group of real life vampires in Edinburgh in the late 19th century. They were called the Hive. They became known as lovely but dangerous partiers, seducing men and women with drugs and alcohol and then making them donate their blood to them, so to speak. Some of the victims even joined the Hive and she became their leader too. In 1882 and 1884, she was apparently voted the scariest woman in England, even though she never left Scotland. That's how scary she is. She scared another country she didn't even live in. Moving on to number two now, we have the vulture and the little girl. On March 26th, 1993, the New York Times shared a picture known as Struggling Girl. It showed a famine stricken boy, initially believed to be a girl who had collapsed from malnutrition during a famine in South Sudan. In the background, a vulture waits patiently. These birds have a keen sense of death and this one has its eyes on the boy. The picture shocked the world. The photographer, Kevin Carter, was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for his photography. He actually killed himself just four months later. The reasons are largely unknown, but many people speculate that pictures like this can drive anyone down a dark path. And finally, number one now, we have the Hiroshima shadows. When the US dropped a nuclear bomb on Japan's Hiroshima, over 100,000 people were killed. Some of them who were close enough were literally vaporized into thin air. The intense heat of the explosion caused what's now called nuclear shadows. The blast forever change services because of the UV radiation. Services that were blocked by people look different to its surroundings, leaving a sort of permanent shadow of the person who was vaporized. This is one of the most striking images for me. What appears to be an old person stood at the bottom of the steps. You can even see the cane in their hand. It's a shocking reminder of how destructive weapons of war have become, how quickly life can be snuffed out in an instant, leaving only a shadow behind. Starting off at number 10 now, we have Edward Paisnell. He's also known as the Beast of Jersey. He was a notorious sex offender who terrorized people on the island of Jersey in the English Channel between 1960 and 1971. This is what he wore when breaking into people's homes at night. A rubber mask and nail studded wristlets. He would attack women and children. He was convicted of 13 counts of assault. Sadly that is thought to be only the tip of the iceberg and there are perhaps many more victims than that. Paisnell was sentenced to 30 years in prison and later died on the Isle of Wight in 1994. Next up at number 9 now we have Blanche. Monnier. In 1901, the Paris Attorney General received an anonymous letter saying that a woman in Paris was being held prisoner against her will. When police arrived at the scene, this was what they saw. Blanche had been locked away in a secret room by her own mother for 25 years. She hadn't even seen sunlight in all of that time. In 1876, at the age of 25, her mother had locked her away after she tried to marry a lawyer who was not to her mother's liking. Her mother and brother continued living their lives after that pretending to mourn the loss of Blanche, but the whole time she was living in this secret room. When police found her, the mother was arrested, she became ill and died 15 days later. Her brother was found to be mentally incapacitated. As for Blanche, she suffered from mental health problems and lived out the next 12 years of her life in a psychiatric hospital before dying at the age of 64. Next up at number 8 now, we have Reynaldo Dagza. He was a politician from the Philippines who photographed his family outside of their home on New Year's Day. The moment he took this photo, he was shot and killed by the man you can see in the background of this picture. A member of the past 
Passaway gang claim to have shot him as retribution for being shot in the head by some of his associates during a shootout months earlier. Now this picture is thought to actually be one of the only examples, if not the only example, of someone capturing their own assassination on film. How mental is that? Moving on to number 7 now, we have Rodney Alcala. He's an American convicted rapist and serial killer who was sentenced to death in California in 2010 for 5 murders committed there between 1977 and 1979. In 1978, he was a contestant on the ABC game show The Dating Game. Here's a picture of him on the show. It's made even more chilling when you realise that by this point he had already killed 2 women. The host introduced him as a successful photographer who got his start when his father found him him in the dark room at the age of 13 fully developed. Between takes you might find him skydiving or motorcycling. He won a date with a contestant on the show called Cheryl Bradshaw. She later refused to go out with him because she found him creepy. Yeah. Seems that her instincts were 100% accurate on that one. Coming at number 6 now, we have Electrical Charge. Now at first glance, this picture looks like quite a wholesome one. It's a picture of 18 year old Michael McQuilkin and his 12 year old brother Sean. The year was 1975 and they had just climbed California's Morro Rock Mountain. Their hair that's standing up from the Electrical Charge is a sure sign that a lightning strike is about to occur. They didn't heed the warning from nature though and just moments after this picture was taken, they were struck by a lightning. Now, some online articles claim that they died, but this wasn't the case. In an interview decades later, Michael said he remembers a flash of white light as bright as arc wielding, a deafening explosion, and a feeling of becoming weightless and being lifted off the ground. They were knocked unconscious and suffered third degree burns, but learnt their lesson for life. Moving on to number 5 now, we have Omeira Sanchez. She was a 13 year old Colombian girl killed in the aftermath of the 1985 eruption of the Nevada del Ruiz volcano. After her home was destroyed, she was pinned beneath the debris of her own house where she remained trapped in water for three days. When authorities found her, she was in good spirits. They attempted to pull her out but found the task impossible without breaking her legs in the process. Each time a person tried to pull her up, the water pulled around her, rising so that it seemed she would drown if they let her go. They found that her legs were caught under a door made of bricks with her dead aunt's arms clutched tightly around her legs. Sanchez eventually died as a result of either gangrene or hypothermia, the photographer felt the photo was a way to report properly on the courage and the suffering and the dignity of this little girl. Next up at number 4 now we have Columbine. This picture may look like a normal school photo, but it has a dark story attached to it. It is the class of 99 from Columbine School, taken just a few weeks before the infamous school shooting there that killed 12 students and one teacher as well as injuring a further 21 people. The shooters were Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. In this picture, they can be seen in the top left with their friends pretending to shoot guns. This school shooting is regarded as one of the deadliest high school massacres in US history and sparked debates over gun control laws, high school cliques, subcultures and bullying. Next up at number 2 now we have animal abuse. This is a picture that will enrage any animal lovers out there. It's of Alina Savchenko. She and her friend Alina Orlova were accused of torturing and killing cats and dogs for occult sexual fetish videos that were sent to China. How how bizarre is that sentence? The Russian pair were linked to the case after police linked all over to the videos because of a distinctive hand tattoo. They tried to flee as the story gathered over the images but were eventually detained under house arrest. When she was detained, Savchenko called herself the Devil's Duchess. In one picture, she is shown holding a recently killed puppy's heart with the caption, It's for you, Anubis, a reference to the ancient Egyptian god of the dead. And finally, the more one now, we have Panama. We're going to look at more than one picture here. There's quite a few. They are of Dutch tourists Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon. In 2014, the pair went missing after taking a day hike near the town of Boquet in Panama. These pictures were found on their recovered camera, which contains over 100 photos, all taken within 10 days of the girls going missing. Some locals found bone fragments and a backpack believed to be owned by one of them. Later, DNA tests confirmed that the remains did belong to them. The last few pictures are perhaps the most disturbing, taken in the middle of the night in the jungle a full 8 days after the girls went missing. Many people were stumped by the mystery of what happened to them and why they were taking pictures of the jungle after 8 days of being lost. The leading theory is that they fell off a cliff, injuring one of them so that she couldn't move. The uninjured one then waited with her friend for 8 days before leaving her. Why leave in the middle of the night though? Well, some people think something scared her into suddenly leaving. 
perhaps a jaguar or other predator. In the end though, both of them died and these pictures are the only creepy clues as to piecing together what happened. Starting off at number 10 now, we have the uninvited guest. This is a creepy picture originally posted to Reddit. The user said that everyone in this picture knew each other at the party. All the people you see in the light, well, everyone except for one single person. In case you haven't spotted it yet, take a look at the far right of this picture. There you can see a boy with glowing eyes. He's standing in the shadows and appears almost translucent. The person who took this picture said they posted it to Facebook the next day and asked every single other person in the picture if they knew who that face belonged to. No matter how hard they tried, none of them did. While some of them have chosen to forget the picture altogether, others who were there that night have never been able to forget that boy's face. They believe it's the spirit of a child from years before wanting to get in on the party. Ugh. Moving on now to number nine, we have Pogo the Clown. Now for many people, this picture by itself may be terrifying enough. It's a picture taken of Pogo the Clown, taken sometime in the 1970s. Even for an old picture, there's something not quite right about it. People just feel uncomfortable when they view it, and there may be a very good reason for that. The man behind the clown makeup is actually John Wayne Gacy, one of America's most notorious serial killers. During the 1970s in Chicago, he lured 14 young men and boys to his home and tortured them before killing them. He hid their bodies in the crawl space of his own home where he lived with his wife and two children. They had no idea what was going on. By day though, he was Pogo the Clown, appearing at local children's parties to entertain them or potentially even scope them out. He was so popular that he even met the mayor who thanked him for all the joy that he spread. In 1994, he was sentenced to death by lethal injection. One of his final quotes from an interview was simply, the dead won't bother you, it's the living you have to worry about. Moving on now to number eight, we have Telling Grandin. That's the name of the old scrapbook where this picture comes from. It's 28 pages, contain photographs collected by an Evanston, Illinois group during a visit by train to the New Orleans Carnival of 1903. Perhaps in person and viewed in the context of their own time, this picture of a woman in a dress and a mask would seem entertaining, I guess. Many people these days though feel quite the opposite about it. Some have described it as very disturbing, creepy and deeply unsettling. It's been over a hundred years since this picture of a carnival goer was taken and yet the picture has found its way into many lists like this and keeps people coming back to study it and examine why exactly it's so very creepy. For me though, it's those eyes, or rather lack of eyes. What do you guys think? Moving on to number seven now, we have Omar. Of all the pictures in this video, I don't know many that seem as unassuming as this one when you first look at it. This is a picture taken in the town of Omar, Northern Ireland. It was taken on the 15th of August, 1998, a day that would go down in history. Nobody in this picture knew that the red Vauxhall car parked right there actually contained a bomb inside. It was placed there by a splinter group of the IRA who opposed the ceasefire that ended the troubles in Northern Ireland a year before. They had phoned the police to tell them about the bomb so that they could move people away. The warnings were inaccurate though, and police had inadvertently moved people towards that red car with the bomb in. Moments after this picture was taken, the 500 pound bomb went off. 29 people were killed, over 200 were injured. Incredibly, the man and the child in the foreground of this picture survived, but the person who took the picture was killed. Next up number six now, we have Gas Mask. There are rumors that this creepy picture comes from a small Japanese island where local are forced to wear gas masks to protect themselves from the toxic fumes of a nearby volcano. In reality though, it appears to be a picture showing members of the Young Pioneers Youth Group in Soviet Russia donning their gas masks during a civil defense drill near Leningrad in 1937. The government ran group took this picture as a sign of strength meant to show the whole world the efficiency and preparedness of the youth organization. For many people though, it's just a haunting image of faceless children staring you down. Coming in number five now, we have Tyler Hadley. I find this picture very disturbing. Again, it's one of those pictures that needs the backstory for you to truly understand how dark it is. The guy on the right is Tyler Hadley, age 17 at the time. He had sent a text out to his friends earlier that night, inviting them to a party at his family home in Port St. Lucie, Florida. He finished off the text by saying, don't worry, parents won't be here. That sentence is incredibly scary when you learn that Hadley had just beaten his own parents to death with a craw hammer in their own bedroom. He then partied with his friends on the ground floor of the house. None of them had any idea what had happened. One of them actually took this now infamous picture with Hadley himself. He then told one of his friends what he had done. The friend found the bloody bodies in the bedroom and called the police. 
Tyler was sentenced to two life sentences without the possibility of parole. Moving on to number 4 now we have ectoplasm. This picture is said to be from a medium in a trance while contacting the dead. The strange substance streaming across the picture is allegedly ectoplasm. For many years photos like this were quite common, claiming to show ectoplasm oozing from orifices in the medium's body. They claim that spiritual entities drape this substance over their non-physical body, enabling them to interact in the physical and real universe. Among modern day believers though, this picture has become famous due to its mysterious origins. Nobody is quite sure who the onlooker is. Nobody knows who the spiritual medium is. Some people even speculate that they are not a willing participant in this, that they do not want to enter into the trance and speak to the dead. Either way, the striking picture is enough to jog anyone's imagination. Next up number 3 now, we have the hidden mother. This is a picture of a very common practice back in Victorian times. Back then, early cameras had slow exposure times. They required the subject to stay still for a long period of time. Obviously, this is very difficult to do with children. They rarely sit still. If the family wanted to have a picture of just the children, this is what they would do. The hidden mother trick. The photographer would cover the mother in a shawl so they could sit there and hold their child still. It was a popular technique at the time, but it's left us with many creepy pictures like this. Moving on to number 2 now, we have Travis Alexander. This is the last ever picture taken of Travis Alexander. It was taken by his ex-girlfriend Jody Arias while he showered. Moments after the picture was taken, she stabbed him nearly 30 times, severing his jugular vein. She then shot him in the head with a shotgun. A medical examiner later determined that he was likely already dead before the gunshot wound was inflicted. This had come after she had stalked him, accessed his Facebook account and slashed his car tires. Some people have said that by zooming in on Travis's eye, you can actually see Jodie Arias before she attacked. She was charged with first degree murder in 2013 and sentenced to life in prison. Starting off this countdown, we have the wildfires in Greece. Greece has been experiencing the worst forest fires the country has seen since 2007. In 2007, they hit record-breaking temperatures and experienced a terrible drought, which caused a number of fires to break out. As a result, 270,000 hectares of land was destroyed. And now it's happening all over again. Since early August of 2021, a number of wildfires have been threatening Greece. Thousands of people have evacuated. Does Dozens of homes have been destroyed, and thousands of miles of nature and wildlife have been destroyed. It's very devastating, and a part of why this is happening is climate change. We are experiencing hotter and drier weather conditions, which fires thrive in. This is very concerning to scientists. In our ninth spot, we have the hut on the moon. Just recently, China's U-22 rover, which landed on the far side of the moon in 2019, has spotted a weird object lurking on the moon. On the horizon of the moon, it spotted a cube-shaped object that looks like a hut. So it was given the name, the Mystery Hut. Images of this mystery hut have been uploaded online and people believe that this is an alien created structure. Even satellite images from above have picked up this hut as well. For now, the rover is headed closer to the hut to get a better look at it. But the rover isn't the fastest thing out there, so it's going to take a couple of months to get there. That means for months we'll be wondering what the heck this structure is. Moving on to number 8, we have the toxic foam. You see all that white stuff floating in the water beside the people? No, this photo wasn't taken in a very cold country. And no, that is not ice or snow in the water. That is a highly polluted river in Delhi. It's so polluted that it's covered in a snow-like toxic foam. This was a result of illegal dumping of industrial waste and untreated sewage water. For years, the government has promised to clean the river, but they never have followed through with this promise. It's actually very dangerous to humans. That foam is very toxic. Again, this is a huge concern to scientists. It shows the destructive habits of humans, and we are now suffering the consequences. Moving on to number seven, we have the river filled with waste. Pollution is one of the biggest global killers. It's affecting over 100 million people. On top of that, over 1 million seabirds and 100,000 sea mammals are killed by pollution every year. Take a look at this next photo to understand the severity of this problem. This is the Lim River in Serbia. In January of 2021, heavy rain caused their waste systems to fail, and as a result, Serbia's rivers were flooded with waste. To clean all that up could take months, even years. And think of all the sea mammals affected by that waste. It's very depressing looking at this photo. Coming in at number six, we have the body's location. 
Okay, let's take a break from all the depressing pollution and climate change talk and move on to something pretty eerie. Someone on Facebook posted that they found this on the underside of their desk. It reads, the truth is under. This was written inside of one of the desk drawers. When you look under that desk drawer, it says the body lies at, and then it lists location coordinates. If you look up the coordinates, some sort of target range pops up from the satellite view. Now, if someone actually emailed the county sheriff's office and they said their criminal investigations unit was working on it. He also warned people not to go out to the spot by themselves or at all. Apparently, a couple of years ago, there was this 4chan thread where a guy said that a prize was at a certain location and someone went out there and uh, they were never seen again. So yeah. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the surfer. Here's another photo that sadly captures the world's pollution problem. This photo features surfer Didi Serena catching a wave in Java, Indonesia. You can see instead of the water being crystal blue, it's filled with litter. Now this place is said to be the world's most populated island. Not only that, but scientists have said that Indonesia has among the worst water quality in Asia. This is due to the fact that many cities don't have proper trash collection, so the waste ends up on the street or in the water, or it's on the street and then it gets blown into the water. Coming in at number four, we have the flooding. A number of major cities are sinking due to sea levels rising and climate change. In a couple of years, these cities will be uninhabitable and largely underwater. Take Jakarta, Indonesia, for example. Jakarta is said to be the world's fastest sinking city. North Jakarta has sunk 2.5 meters in 10 years and is now sinking 25 centimeters a year in some parts. Research shows that by 2050, 95% of North Jakarta will be submerged underwater. In fact, currently almost half the city is now below sea level. Many buildings are already being flooded. They have tried to repair these buildings from the floods, but they just keep getting damaged from the floods. Now, the Indonesian government actually has a plan in place to move the capital to Java to protect the 10 million residents, but this move would take 10 years and cost $33 billion. But it's not just Jakarta at risk. Major places like New York, Florida, Fiji, New Orleans are also at risk as well. Coming in at number three, we have the Yellow River in Mongolia. This river is so populated that it's almost impossible to breathe near it. It's also extremely hazardous to swim in or to drink. But here's the thing. It used to supply water to millions of people in the north of China, until recent years when it got polluted with factory discharge and sewage. One third of China's Yellow River is now poisonous to drink. Only 16% of the water is safe. If things keep going this way, soon the entire water supply will be unsafe. In our second spot, we have the Amazon rainforest. Over the past 30 years, 15% of the Brazilian Amazon has been destroyed. This is very problematic because this forest alone supplies 20% of the world's oxygen. And nowadays, more and more parts of the rainforest are being burnt down or chopped down. The main cause of deforestation in the Amazon is a need for more farmland. A couple of years ago, cattle ranchers set the Amazon on fire to illegally clear land and then expend their business. Cattle ranching has caused 80% of the deforestation of the Amazon. However, because of climate change, the Amazon is getting drier. So when they burn down the land, it spreads uncontrollably. In 2019, almost a million hectares burnt down. And in our number one spot today, we have the Kenyan drought. Now, this is a very upsetting photo, but it showcases the reality of global warming and climate change. In December of 2021, a prolonged drought in northeast of Kenya caused the death of a number of animals and livestock. This is a photo of six giraffes who sadly passed away due to this destructive drought. The area only received a third of normal rainfall since September. This photo really gets to me. Like, look how destructive humans are. Our actions are killing our home, this planet, and animals are suffering as a result. 